Imagine you are running a giant library with millions of books on endless shelves. Someone walks in and asks you for a specific super rare book. It would be an incredibly time consuming task to examine each book individually. That's kind of the problem engineers face with massive data sets. Traditional search methods struggle with this efficiency. Then, in 1942, a computer scientist named Burton Bloom had an idea. What if we could create a probabilistic filter? A kind of shortcut that tells us with high accuracy if something might exist, even if it doesn't guarantee it's there. This was the birth of the Bloom filter. Today, we'll delve into a fascinating data structure that excels at checking element membership, the Bloom filter. But before we jump in, let's establish a solid foundation by exploring hash tables and the concept of hashing. So, let's get started. Remember that giant library you have with millions of books? Finding a specific book would be a nightmare, right? That's where a special system called a hash table comes in. A hash table is like a super organized library assistant. It takes a book's title, like your username, and creates a unique code, like a secret nickname for that book. This code is called a hash. Think of it like taking all the letters in the title and scrambling them up in a specific way. It's like a shortcut to find the book much faster. The hash table then stores the book along with its secret code or hash in a special place. Now, whenever you want to find the book, the hash table uses the hash like a secret key to find the book, which is your username, in a flash. Here is how hash table works. A specific algorithm or hash function converts the book title into a fixed length hash code. The hash table stores the book title and its corresponding hash together. When you need to find the book, the hash function is applied to the entered book title. The hash table uses the generated hash to quickly locate the associated book title. But what happens if two books have the same hash code by accident? This is called a collision. It's like two friends having the same nickname. In a hash table, if there is a collision, the assistant might have to look in a few different places before finding the right book. Hash tables have mechanisms to handle collisions, but that's beyond the scope of this topic. We can do a deep dive on this topic in future. So coming back to hashing, hashing is the process of generating a hash from data. It involves applying a mathematical algorithm, the hash function, to the data. Hashing is a one-way function. You can easily create a hash from the data, but it is incredibly difficult, ideally impossible to reconstruct the original data from the hash. On the other hand, a hash function is the specific algorithm used to perform hashing. It takes an input, the data, and produces a fixed length output, the hash. Now good hash functions have these properties. They are deterministic. That is, the same input always produces the same output. They have a uniform distribution, meaning the hashes are spread out evenly across the range of possible values. And finally, they are collision resistant. It is very difficult for different inputs to produce the same hash. But even with collisions, hash tables are still much faster than searching through millions of books one by one. And this is why they are fantastic data structures for storing and retrieving data efficiently. But what if you only care about knowing if an element might be present in a set, not necessarily retrieving the element itself? And what if a space is a precious commodity? And that is where Bloom filters shine. Bloom filter in a nutshell is a clever technique that acts like a probabilistic shortcut. It tells us with high accuracy if something might exist, even if it can't guarantee it's there. Think of it like a super efficient index of your data. So let's break down Bloom filters into bite-sized pieces. Imagine a giant bit array, like a row of light switches. Initially, all are off, that is zero. We also use multiple hash functions. In this case, three hash functions, which take any data like a word and scramble it into a unique number that points to a specific switch in the array. When we add a new item to the filter, we feed its name through the hash functions and each function points to a switch in the array and we turn the switches on, that is making them one. It's like marking the item's presence in different locations based on its unique code. Now, to search for an item, we again use the hash functions on its name. We check the corresponding switches in the array. If the switch is off, that is zero, we know for sure the item isn't there. That is a quick no. That's because if the item existed, its addition would have turned on all those switches. But here is the catch. Even if all switches are on or one, it still might be there. 
because other items might have turned on those same switches leading to a maybe answer. This is called a false positive. It's like having multiple roommates using the same light switch. Just because the lights are on doesn't guarantee who turned it on the last. Let's understand this false positives with some specific examples. So here we have three hash function. The banana object is added to the bloom filter. The hash functions outputs values are six, two and nine. And so the array elements are those indexes are changed to one. Then we insert apple. The apple object is added to the bloom filter and the array elements at indices 10, 9 and 4 are assigned to 1. Even though the ninth element of the array was already assigned to 1, its value doesn't change here. And finally, we start doing the lookup. So here, when we check if the orange object is present in the bloom filter, since there is at least one hash function, precisely 2 in our case, outputting an index 7 and 12 of the array whose element is equal to 0, this means the orange does not exist in the filter. But when we look up cherry, we get a false positive. For example, even though the cherry was not added before, the filter thinks it exists as all of the output hash values for cherry point to array elements with value of 1, which is definitely not right. Now, Bloom filters have two key operations, insertion and lookup. To insert an element into a Bloom filter, it is processed through multiple hash functions, typically denoted as k hash functions. Each function maps the input element to a specific position within a bit array. The key operation involves setting the bits at these calculated positions to 1. The lookup operation in Bloom filter is designed to check if an element might be present in the set. The element is passed through the same k hash functions used during the insertion phase. The bit positions indicated by these functions are then examined. If all these positions are set to 1, it suggests that the element could be present in the set, leading to a potentially positive result. However, if any of these positions are 0, the element is definitely not in the set. This operation is crucial for maintaining the integrity of the data within the Bloom filter, ensuring quick responses to queries. Now, as far as handling false positives is concerned, one of the inherent characteristics of Bloom filter is the occurrences of false positives, where the filter might incorrectly indicate the presence of an element that isn't actually in the set, as we saw in the case of Cherry. This happens due to the overlap of bit positions from different elements being hashed to the same positions. While false negatives are not possible, managing false positives is crucial for the effectiveness of Bloom filter. The probability of false positives can be adjusted by changing the size of the bit array and the number of hash functions used. Generally, a larger array and more hash functions decrease the likelihood of false positives, but at the cost of increased space and computational overhead. So understanding and managing this trade-off is key to optimizing the performance of Bloom filters in various applications. Bloom filters offer a fantastic trade-off. They are incredibly fast and use less memory compared to traditional search methods, making them perfect for massive datasets. However, the chance of false positives increases as the filter fills up with more items, just like a crowded room with more people using the same light switch. So how do we optimize Bloom filters? The very first method is to optimally calculate the number of hash functions. The number of hash functions denoted as k plays a pivotal role in the performance and accuracy of Bloom filter. An optimal k value balances the trade-off between the set bits in the bit array and the computational demand. So before inserting objects into the Bloom filter, we can find the optimal number of required hash functions k that will minimize the FP or the false positive probability if we know the array size m and can estimate the number of objects n that will be inserted in the future. And here is the formula that helps to find this balance. Here, the k is optimal number of hash functions, n is estimated number of inserted objects, and m is the array size. So basically, k is the optimal number of hash functions that minimizes the false positive probability. The other method is to increase the size of the bit array. Now, expanding the size of Bloom filter, m is another effective method to lower the false positive rate. A large bit array provides more space for distributing hash functions outputs, thereby reducing the chance of collisions. 
And finally, a novel approach involves using multiple bloom filters to cross verify the results. When a primary bloom filter returns a positive, its secondary filters are queried. And if these additional secondary checks yield negatives, the initial positive can be deemed a false positive. And this method enhances accuracy without necessitating a large increase in memory usage. Bloom filters are particularly useful in situations where space and speed are at premium and where occasional false positives are an acceptable compromise. So bloom filters aren't just theoretical. They power many real-world applications. In fact, Bloom filters significantly enhance database performance by reducing unnecessary data lookups. For instance, databases like Apache Cassandra utilize Bloom filters to determine if a key exists in an SS table, avoiding costly disk reads if the key is absent. Similarly, PostgreSQL and Google Bigtable apply Bloom filters to minimize disk lookups for non-existing rows or columns, thus optimizing read operations and resource utilization. In web and internet applications, Bloom filters are employed to improve user experience and security. For example, Google Chrome previously used Bloom filters to rapidly check if a URL was malicious, thereby enhancing browser safety. Social media platforms like Facebook use Bloom filters to avoid storing rarely searched data known as one-hit wonders locally, thus saving storage space. Additionally, Content recommendation systems like those on Medium leverage Bloom filters to prevent suggesting articles that a user has already seen, enhancing content relevance and user engagement. Now, beyond databases and web applications, Bloom filters find utility in various other sectors. In cryptocurrency systems such as Bitcoin, Bloom filters are used to synchronize wallets and reduce the risk of DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks by filtering unnecessary data transmission. Network routers employ Bloom filters to manage IP addresses and prevent DOS attacks efficiently. Moreover, spell checkers have evolved to use Bloom filters to verify words against a dictionary, quickly reducing the time to identify misspelled words. Bloom filters are a powerful tool for speeding up searches in massive datasets. Even with small chance of a maybe answer, they are a brilliant example of trading a tiny bit of accuracy for significant performance gains. So, the next time you are searching for something online or a librarian navigates to a massive library, Bloom filters might be working behind the scenes, making the process faster and more efficient. So thanks for joining us on the deep dive in the Bloom filter system design. And if you have any questions or want to learn more about the specific applications, leave a comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more tech videos.